Hello, and welcome to Dave Doesn't Know. This week, I'm talking about the infamous D.B. Cooper, whoever he is. D.B. Cooper, who is he? Why is he? And more important, where is he? If you don't know about D.B. Cooper, where have you been? If you already know about him and are sick to death of all the documentaries, the books, the films, the scripture, the scripture? Yeah, all of that. The, the pamphlets, the leaflets, whatever the difference is, then I'm sorry too. However, watch on. I think you'd be very interested in this one. It's a great story. In 1971, a Boeing 727 operated by Northwest Orient Airlines was flying about the place on its way from Portland to Washington. It was during that flight that a man in a suit and a clip on tie told the flight attendant he had a bomb. Now straight away getting into this, it's 1971, the 70s, hijacking was rife. There was loads of incidences, some successful, some not so. What a nightmare situation to be in. The flight attendant, 22-year-old Tina Mucklow, would remain seated next to Cooper as he chatted about the view and other facts about the area. A local man, perhaps? Cooper was demanding $200,000. Now, by today's standards, that's about $1.4 which, to be honest, sounds a little bit Austin Powers to me. He also demanded... Four parachutes upon landing in Washington, Seattle to be precise. Cooper was described as polite, calm, middle-aged and carrying a black attaché case. He was wearing a black or brown suit with dark tie and white shirt. A little bit like the FBI. Now the actual ticket that he purchased was in the name of Dan Cooper. It wasn't to the press got hold of it that I think it was lost in translation and he got the name D.B. Cooper. It's a bit difficult to get them mixed up but D.B. Cooper, Dan Cooper, I guess it sounds a little bit more exciting. And obviously that's going to sell papers. That's just my opinion, of course. Cooper promised to release all the passengers upon landing in Seattle, where he wanted the money, the parachutes and the plane refueled before taking off to Mexico. So let's recap. This guy's confident. He's polite. He knew about fuel stops and what amount of fuel was required. He knew where to stop. He knew the lay of the land. Conspiracy theories, all winding themselves up into Dave doesn't know territory. <sighs> the plane landed in Washington and Cooper released all the passengers. With money in hand and his parachutes, he took off to Mexico. It was 30 minutes into that flight to Mexico that Cooper went to the rear of the plane, opened the back door, released the stairs and at 10,000 feet, jumped out. He was never seen again. In 1980, so nine years later, a little lad, eight-year-old, Brian Ingram, found some money washed up on a river where his parents and him were holidaying. After being confirmed as part of the ransom money by the FBI, it only added more confusion and more complex issues to the case. Why was that money there? Why had it taken so long to wash up? Why were the rubber bands still intact? Surely they would have disintegrated as well. Was it planted there? Was it a red herring? Who can tell? This is why we investigate stuff like this. Ingram was allowed to keep some of the money after negotiations with the FBI. Now in 2008, he sold some of the bills at auction for $37,000. What an investment. The FBI had many suspects they targeted mainly military veterans, skydiving instructors, and anyone really that fit the description. Okay, so we have Ted Braden. Uh, he was a Special Forces Commando during the Vietnam War, a master skydiver, and a convicted felon. He was believed by many within the Special Forces community, both at the time of the hijacking and in subsequent years, to have been Cooper. Nevertheless, he wasn't, obviously. Then we have Kenneth Peter Christiansen. This was a guy that actually worked as a mechanic 
for the Northwest Airlines. He was also a paratrooper. <sighs> Here we go. Very, very close. Now, there's one suspect that sticks out for me. L.D. Cooper. You can't make it up, can you? Lynn Doyle Cooper. Now, interestingly, his eight-year-old niece remembers around the time of the hijacking, uh, her uncle and someone else were planning something rather mischievous. And uh, the next day, the hijacking happened and um, L.D. Cooper came home with blood on his shirt. Um, and injuries, uh, for, you know, maybe from jumping out of a plane. I don't know whether that's uh, something that could actually happen. Howdy, Cooper. Apparently, he was also obsessed with uh, Dan Cooper, the, um, the the hero at the time in, in movies and comics. So, read into that what you will. I think it's him. It's him. I've solved it. Done. For me, Richard McCoy looks like the sketch. This is the guy that I think done it is D.B. Cooper, however you want to say it. He was an army veteran, he was in the Vietnam War, he was a helicopter pilot, a skydiver, and, you know, did a copycat hijack in 1972. It was exactly the same. Four parachutes, this time $500,000, for which he was caught for and convicted and got 45 years. Okay, so lastly, we have Robert Wesley Rackstraw. Now, he was a retired pilot, an ex-convict who served in the Army helicopter crew during the Vietnam War. Um, he uh, tried to fake his own death. Um, he was a skydiver. I think he looks just like the sketches. Um, so uh, he's been uh, the one that everyone's wanted since the start of this in 1971. Um, but... The FBI limited, eliminated him as a suspect in 1979, so lack of evidence, I guess. So, yeah, there's a, there's another one. Um, the the FBI one. had no conclusive evidence and debated whether or not he'd actually survived the fall. Jumping out of an airplane, no previous experience, or so they thought. The adverse weather conditions, not knowing the lay of the land. Of course, it all contradicts each other because witnesses say that he did know the lay of the land. And he's got skydiving experience. Look how confident he was going to the back of the plane and jumping out, knowing at what height to jump, knowing at what speed, knowing where to jump, knowing about fuel stops. This guy's got inside information or is a veteran of something. This remains an unsolved case 51 years later. Now, the question you're all asking, obviously, is does Dave know? Well, on this occasion, I don't. There's a surprise. Um, the thing that gets me about this investigation, about this whole story, is that they had so many suspects with so many details that were so close, yet the FBI did nothing about it. They obviously know what they're doing, but do they? Thanks for watching, guys. Thanks for tuning in. It's been an absolute pleasure to do this story. Um, there are more videos to come. Um, the, the script writing process, uh, yeah, there is a script. Uh, it all takes time. The editing is, takes the longest and trying to put things together and stuff like that. And... Uh, get rid of all the bloopers and that stupid cat um yeah so they are on their way and uh, but thanks for tuning in and uh, please like and subscribe i really do appreciate all your comments and stuff like that i do have an instagram page now as well called dave doesn't know so check that out if you can uh and uh, give me a follow and give me a message i'll always try and message you back as well and uh, especially if you've got some ideas for future videos i mean there are loads so thanks for watching check these videos out